सुनील भाई सर गुड इवनिंग रक्षा सर गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग सुनील सर गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग मैडम गुड इवनिंग आई आई यू एम फाइन सर डॉक्टर बालवा जी डॉक्टर रमेश इज ट्राइंग टू चेंज द बैकग्राउंड इन द मीन टाइम इफ वी आर एबल टू स्टार्ट द सेशन या प्लीज द मीटिंग इज लाइव स्ट्रीम नाउ ऑन द यूट्यूब यू कैन स्टार्ट डॉक्टर मनीषा यू कैन स्टार्ट गुड इवनिंग ऑल we welcome you for this uh, first series of interactive webinar that is i secrets it is clinical reasoning and problem solving webinar the first webinar is dedicated to obstetric anesthesia under the able guidance of our president sir dr bhimeshwar academic chairman dr venkat giri and our dynamic secretary dr bajwa i think now everything is possible under the under the uh, uh, name of isa so this interactive and innovation innovative educational webinars will be devoted to the clinical reasoning and problem solving and various clinical dilemmas and scenarios in the academic practice i welcome you all for this academic series i request uh, our doctor uh, uh, honorary secretary dr sukhinder ji singh bajwa to have his introductory speech thank you dr manisha uh, i It's uh, a very pleasant feeling to welcome everyone on this platform. Majority of us know each other, and uh, this is a, a very apt platform for such series which we are starting now, the CRIS series. Already we have done with the CLIP series, which started two weeks back. Uh, now the CRIS series. Everyone will be wondering why so many webinars from the ISA website. for everyone the main objective was that in a conference any national conference or even the state conference or the zonal conferences it's very difficult to attend many times you get a family commitments or sometime other professional commitments and even when you make it to the conferences sometime there are three or four lectures going simultaneously in different halls and it's become very difficult to attend to all and these are the very practical deliberations which we missed during the conference hours also the main idea to start this series is that spread me over a week or fortnightly this series will be dealing with those topics which will be very useful especially to our private practitioners because those are the people who get a minimal time to travel and they are the people who have been left out in spite of so many efforts done to attract them to the conferences all these people all our private practitioners now they will have a luxury of getting a weekly webinar on all the practical situations or all the complicated situations or scenarios which they are dealing in every day's life and to host them to all these programs will be you know moderated by the one of the best academicians and practitioners of the country today dr sunanda gupta ma'am and dr anju garewal ma'am i don't know ki anybody is there in this hall who doesn't know them so it's a very well set stage where we are going to deal with all the practical and clinical scenarios where everyone gets entrapped at some stage of life or the other and possibly we will try to find out the solutions which are very practical nature Genius. feasible and in doing so it is basic main objective is to have better anesthesia services in our peripheries to make the life of our practitioner a little more easier not just practitioner when the admissions are there it is for everyone but our main aim for the this year is to at least bring the practitioner to the main academic mainstream in this series we are starting with obstetric anesthesia and in the due course of time you will be getting introduced to all the speakers who are renowned speakers renowned academicians renowned practitioners and at the end of this webinar you can recollect many things which will help you in daily practice of anesthesia services so main idea is to have these webinars spread over a week other than overdosing 
these are for everyone it's not like that we are giving more of a academic dosages to the practitioner these are for your own choices you see the topic being covered in these type of webinars and you can attend at your leisure your luxury at your own convenient time even if you want to attend and you miss it somehow these will be available on isa nhq at youtube channel so that you can later on see it in a recorded version and you can always imbibe the good points from these type of webinars so starting today is a very auspicious day and most importantly these webinars the program heads are our dynamic trio of dr manoj kumar dr chintala kishan and dr manisha katikar and they will be ably supported throughout this crisp series by the all good academic coordinators of the country today is dr sharad and dr punam godki they will be helping all our pro three program heads and these three program heads will be working with the brainstorming for all the type of the topics they have to be covering in the coming weeks so i think it will be one of the very beautiful series will be well appreciated and without wasting time i hand over the mic back to dr manisha katekar thank you so much sir thanks a lot for your guidance uh, i request dr bimeshwar sir now to guide us yeah good evening good evening everyone um the chairman of the academic committee dr venkatagiri honorary secretary dr bajwa the program coordinators of from isa dr manoj dr manisha katekar dr kishan and uh, everyone who are attending this crisp uh, program of the isa wonderfully selected uh, program and uh, i was wondering what is crisp so actually uh, the the nemonic i mean uh, the crisp was a, a clinical reasoning and problem solving interactive session so i was wondering what exactly is the crisp and all when dr manisha katikar had told me but uh, now bajwa has made it very clear for me that it is it will be a wonderful interactive session by the isa and uh, the purpose of the crisp also has been uh, clearly told by our secretary and i'm sure this will be going a long way and uh, the first topic that is the obstetric anesthesia chosen who better than uh, dr sunanda gupta dr anju grewal dr ravindra add sunil pandya to that and you will have the best of uh, obstetric anesthetists in the country and uh, i'm sure dr sharad and dr punam will be doing a wonderful job in this uh, uh, program of crisp and i wish the program all success thank you very much thank you so much sir it's so nice to see you still, you are traveling but still you have joined this webinar thank you so much thank dr. you prisha one minute uh, dr navin has also joined he should be told that dr chintala kishan just praised him like anything and he has thrown an open challenge to me that dr navin was the best uh, secretary so you have to work very hard to come <laughs> to that level so uh, just for a compliment to dr navin anyway yeah. <laughs> so you can take over from here yeah dr venkatgiri has joined sir वेबिनार्ट Good thank you to all uh, isa dignitaries for the brief introduction and encouraging words myself dr poonam godki and dr sharad kumar we are the academic moderators for today's session i thank isa national honor <coughs> secretary for giving us this opportunity to conduct and moderate the today's webinar so let me first introduce to you the program heads for today's webinar uh, first is dr manoj kumar who is from gaya he is the isa treasurer national and also program head for cultural and art literary group uh, may i request dr manoj kumar to say a few encouraging words to us thank you so much madam uh, i am very happy that national has started official for all of the member of isa especially president as a program head 
I want to assure everyone that in coming days, the CRISP series webinar will be a great learning session for all the members of the ISA, Long Live ISA. Thank you so much, Poonam Madam. Over to Dr. Poonam Gurdki Madam. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I now introduce Dr. Chintala Kishan, who is our program head. Uh, Dr. Chintala Kishan is the GC member ISA National and also a senior consultant from Telangana. Dr. Chintala, a few words from you, please. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, respected President and Secretary and Academic Chairman Venkatagiri Sar. Venkatagiri Sar, of course, he is very easy. I don't don't know. This is an excellent topic uh, in, uh, introduced by Dr. Manisha. I congratulate Manisha with this very nice. They uh, selecting this uh, eclampsia, uh, uh, this uh, selecting this object eclampsia is a very good for private practitioners. Treating it is a challenging to the anesthetists rather than the obstetricians. How to go? How to? What are the things? Why eclampsia is developed? What are the conditions previous? How to manage? These are all the challenging to the anesthetists. I'm very happy. Uh, thank you very much for adding me in this as a moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. Manisha Katikar, who is from Solapur National GC member. She is the leader for us from Maharashtra. I request her to speak a few words. Thank you, Dr. Poonam. I've already spoken, but uh, on the behalf of IIT, yes, I will assure you all that uh, we'll strive hard to make this script series more interesting, educational breaks, practical oriented, and with good take home messages. Thank you. Poonam, uh, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Sharad Kumar. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Dr. Puna. Thank you very much. We are starting the session. Now, We, I, I, it is my proud privilege to introduce one of the chairperson, Dr. Sunanda Gupta, madam. She is Emirates professor and ex-professor HOD, RMT Medical College, Gitanjali Medical College. Presently, she is affiliated with the Gitanjali Medical College, Udaipur. She uh, is the executive member Asia Oceana Obstetric Anesthesia, executive member of the ICA Working Committee. And she has a special interest in obstetric anesthesia. She has 144 publications in her name and 22 test chapters in the national and international test book. She is in the editorial board of the JACP and JOACC and IJCA. She was the founder president association of the obstetric anesthesia in India. And she is the visiting professor at the Harvard Boston. Uh, she was in 2017. And she is the faculty at international conference at Iran, Poland, Jakarta, Manila, Kuala Lumpur, and so many places. So welcome Dr. Sunanda Gupta, uh, Sunanda Gupta Madam to our uh, this seven CME. Uh, Dr. Uh, welcome Dr. Sunanda Gupta. Dr. Poonam, over to you. Uh, it is indeed an honor for me to welcome our next chairperson, Dr. Man Anju, Anju Grewal, Madam. She is Professor and HOD Ames Batinda. Uh, she mm. has been Vice President of RACCP and also former Editor-in-Chief of AOACP, National Secretary of AOA and President of ISA Punjab. She has more than 90 publications and more than 12 chapters in book. I think she actually needs no introduction. Welcome, Madam. Now I would like to invite Dr. G. L. Uh, Ravindra. Uh, he has done his MBBS from the Mysore Medical College, MD from the Karnataka Medical College, Hubli, and DA from the Bangalore Medical College, Bangalore. He was the former professor and HOD, Department of Anesthesiology, Simoga Institute of Medical Science, Simoga. Presently, he is the chief consultant of the Janani Anesthesia and Critical Care Services, Simoga. And he has a vast experience in the obstetric anesthesia and has performed more than 13,000 labor epidural. Uh, and he has a special interest in the airway and regional anesthesia also. And he was the organizing secretary of the Karnataka State ISA conference in 2002. And he was the president of the ISA Karnataka State branch in 2003. So welcome, sir. Yeah, it is again a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Manisha Shambaker, which also who is also a great friend of mine. She is consultant and joint uh, medical director of Omega Hospitals, Nagpur. She is the honorary secretary of Home Charitable Foundation. She had received President Appreciation Award and Proficiency Award in 2019. She also has got multiple publications in her list. Welcome, ma'am. Now, it is my also proud, proud privilege to introduce Dr. J. L. Alwani. She is the professor, Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care at Pandit JLN, JNM Medical College, Raipur, Chhattisgarh. She is the member secretary of the Institutional Ethical Committee. She is the instructor of the BCLS, CCLS, 
she is the executive member of the society of study of pain raipur she was the organizing secretary of the sixth zonal conference central zone in 2014 she has worked uh, in the various workshop on ethics and medical research and labor analgesia she has received best national trainer award from the ministry of health and family welfare in the 2014 and she has also received presidential appreciation award in 2015 and she has 30 national and international public, uh, public uh, in the journals and she has given more than 50 lecture in the national journal state conference and she has a special interest in the obstetric anesthesia and is spreading public awareness of uh, on the cpr welcome dr jaya madam thank you sir and now i request dr jaya madam to please start a topic how i do it and your time is 8 minute ma'am i will start uh, sharing the screen is it visible yes yes i can full screen thank yeah. you dr sharad yeah, for yeah. kind words yeah madam respected president isa national dr mv bhimeshwar honorary secretary isa national dr sukminder jeet bajwa chairman academic committee dr venkat giri academic moderators dr poonam dr sharad the trio of program heads dr manoj dr chintala dr manisha chairpersons dr sunanda gupta dr anju grewal seniors and my dear friends a very good evening to all I would like to congratulate IASA for starting this crisp series and the wonderful interactive sessions. Also, I would like to thank the IASA National to give me this wonderful opportunity to speak before you all and share this case management of an eclampsia patient for emergency cesarean section. Now, here we have a patient, 23 year old, with 35 weeks of amenorrhea, with fetal distress, history of seizures six hours ago, received one dose of magnesium sulfate. severe right upper quadrant pain bp is 168 by 114 mm of hg heart rate 80 respiratory rate of 20 a febrile now alert and oriented with mild pedal edema airways malampatti grade 3 platelets 90000 raised liver enzymes and creatinine of 1.1 now what are the things which are troubling me the uncontrolled blood pressure recurrent seizures appropriate fluid management and the deranged lab reports so the aim of my uh, therapy would be to start the antihypertensive drugs and lower the mean arterial blood pressure by 15 to 25% with a target of systolic blood pressure between 120 to 160 mm of hg and diastolic between 80 to 105 so as to prevent the adverse maternal sequelae of hypertensive encephalopathy and cerebrovascular hemorrhage myocardial infarction so start with lebetalon or hydralazine which are the first line drugs mind you there is no role of sublingual nifedipine rather oral nifedipine is the first line agent when there is no intravenous excess other drugs which can be used to control the blood pressure is nitroglycerin nitroprusside or even glycerol trinitrate now she has received one dose of magnesium sulfate so it can be followed by an infusion of 1 to 2 g per hour or if there are recurrent convulsions add a bolus of 2 to 4 g over 5 to 10 minutes but before giving any subsequent doses of magnesium it should be checked that the respiratory rate is at least 16 per minute the patellar reflexes are present and the urine output of 30 ml per hour over 4 hours what investigations do i need a full blood count serum electrolytes the coagulation profile ptinr liver function test serum magnesium and calcium and blood grouping and cross matching so after 4 hours we have already started the antihypertensive Uh, therapy and the blood pressure is now stabilized the bp is 140 80 the patient is alert and oriented so i'll go for single shot spinal anesthesia for this patient because general anesthesia is associated with more untoward outcomes the reports say also the single shot spinal anesthesia is beneficial because maternal mortality rate directly due to anesthesia is more than 16 times in general anesthesia as compared to regional and the leading cause of death in eclampsia patients is reported to be intracranial hemorrhage regional anesthesia also blunts the hemodynamic and the neuroendocrine stress response avoids the risk of general anesthesia the risk of aspiration and difficult intubation we all are worried about hypotension so don't you worry 
because we will use manual left uterine displacement and spinal anesthesia, it causes increased vascular sensitivity to vasoconstrictors. Also, the studies show that the hypotension is short-lived, easily treated with smaller doses of vasopressors, and it is not associated with any negative fetal outcomes. There is also controversy regarding the platelet count because it is low in eclampsia patients. So if it is less than one lakhs per cubic mm, the trend of the platelets over six hours should be taken. And if the status of the patient is declining, you can go for more frequent tens, one to three hourly. More than 70,000, it is reasonable to proceed with the neuraxial blocks. Weigh the risk benefit ratio if the platelet count is between 50,000 to 70,000 and less than 50,000, avoid the neuraxial procedure. What do the ASRA guidelines say? Frank coagulopathy is absolute contraindication. If the patient is on unfractionated heparin, check the platelet count before needle placement and removal of catheter if duration of low molecular weight heparin is more than four days. Stop heparin four to six hours prior to the needle placement. What if the patient is on low molecular weight heparin? The needle placement and catheter removal should be done 10 to 12 hours after the last dose. And if the patient is on higher therapeutic doses after 24 hours. The first post-operative dose has to be given after six to eight hours and repeat dose after at least two hours of catheter removal. What monitoring do we need? We all are doing this routine monitoring and this is all what you have to do in eclampsia patients also. The ECG, the non-invasive blood pressure, saturation, end tidal carbon dioxide, PNS if it is available, urine output, fetal heart sounds until the beginning of surgery and the CVP. When is intra-arterial blood pressure indicated? During induction and emergence from GA with poorly controlled hypertension. When frequent ABGs are needed, especially in cases of pulmonary edema, or when there are rapid potential fluctuations in the blood pressure with the use of peripheral vasodilators. Here is another patient, a 29-year-old female, Gravida 1, who reported in the emergency room 35 weeks of gestation with fetal distress, the blood pressure is 182 by 101, 111 millimeters of mercury. She's unconscious after three episodes of convulsions with a normal hematocrit, platelets of 50,000, and the hepatic enzymes are normal. So what will be the choice of anesthesia in this patient? General anesthesia, because she's unconscious, uncontrolled seizures, low platelets. Luckily, the airway is reassuring, but with sustained fetal bradycardia. What are the challenges? when we opt for general anesthesia in these patients, the potential of establishing a secure airway in view of the edema of the upper airway, transient but severe hypertension, both at the time of tracheal intubation and extubation, and the effects of magnesium sulfate on neuromuscular transmission and the uterine tone. So have a backup smaller endotracheal tubes, supraglottic airways, video laryngoscope, a ramped position can be used for intubating the patient. There's higher risk of aspiration, which has to be combated with the rapid sequence intubation, the use of H2 blockers and IV metoclopramide. High oxygen flows should be given with the nasal cannula. Antihypertensive treatment to target the systolic blood pressure between 140 and 160 and diastolic between 90 and 100 mm of Hg with the use of levetolol, esmolol, L-fentanyl, and even a bolus magnesium sulfate dose can be given to reduce the blood pressure. What are the controversies with magnesium sulfate and the neuromuscular blocking agents? They potentiate and prolongs the action of neuromuscular blockage. But the dose of succinylcholine need not to be reduced during the rapid sequence in the induction to achieve optimal conditions for intubation. Small but incremental doses of non-depolarizer muscle blo uh, blockers should be given during the surgery, that too with monitoring with PNS whenever available. But if there are signs of toxicity of magnesium, respiratory depression, low urine output, so give 10 ml, 10% calcium gluconate over 10 minutes. Now there is controversy also with the fluid management because there is capillary leak syndrome in eclampsia patients. The infused fluids, they leak into the extravascular space. So there is paradox of intravascular volume depletion and increased extracellular volume. So it is better to restrict fluids to 80 ml per hour along with continuous urine output monitoring. Use invasive blood pressure whenever indicated. Non-invasive monitors like cardiac output and T whenever available can be resorted to. 
Now, this patient may need ventilatory support in the post-operative period along with monitoring. Extubation has to be supported by esmolol or lignocaine because you have to prevent the hypertensive response at the time of extubation. Analgesia can be given with tab block. It should be good in the post-operative period. Wound infiltration, systemic analgesics can be used. Magnesium sulfate should be continued for 24 hours after the delivery or last convulsions. The immediate risk of laryngeal edema, left ventricular dysfunction, pulmonary edema, stroke, and venous thromboembolism should be kept in mind. So there's a pivotal role of anesthesiologist, giving the anesthesia, analgesia, and critical care. Eclampsia is a complex disease which taxes the expertise of even the most experienced obstetric anesthesiologist. So focus on stabilization of blood pressure, optimization of fluid status, and prevent prevention of convulsions. Successful and safe peripartum management of eclampsia patient and a safe infant is a team effort. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jaya Madam, for the truly enlightening and crisp lecture. Uh, we have noted down all the queries that have come on the chat box, but we would be answering them, uh, Jaya Madam would be answering them towards the end of the session. I would request our uh, chairpersons, Dr. Sunanda Ma'am and Dr. Anju Ma'am to give their expert opinions uh, on this talk, please. Uh, congrats to the team for of B, Dr. Bhimeshwar and Dr. Bajwa for starting this crisp, crisp series and having obstetric anesthesia and that too such important topics which each and every anesthesiologist are going to face in their clinical practice. So uh, there are some pearls which I would want to highlight though Dr. Jaya has done a great job highlighting all the important aspects mm -hmm. of eclamptic patients. What I want to specifically highlight is that, remember, you have to be very careful about the blood pressure in these patients. And uh, the blood pressure should be kept below uh, 140 by 90. And as you know, it can, severe hypertension can lead to stroke, MI, pulmonary edema, and respiratory failure. And if you don't take care of the seizures, Seizures can again lead to pulmonary edema and aspiration pneumonitis, DIC, acute renal failure, and intracranial hemorrhage. So we as anesthesiologists have a very important role to manage both the seizures as well as the blood pressure in these patients. So as she said, uh, managing the intravenous fluids in the intrapartum period as well as the postpartum period is really important because you can see Severe hypertension can cause pulmonary edema as well as eclamptic seizures can cause pulmonary edema. So remember, always keep the fluid levels low at one mil per kg per hour. And of course, you have got such sophisticated equipments to measure the left ventricular volume and the fluid uh, compartment can be easily measured now. But just uh, remember that you have to take care of the end organ perfusion. So be careful about the four important factors, your urine output, your mental status of the patient, the lactate and the pH values. So these are some small points that I wanted to highlight. And beyond that, uh, your platelet counts. These patients may be very prone, though the incidence is very low of spinal or epidural hematoma, it's one in 200 to one in 250,000. But you should always be well aware, you should do the neurological monitoring every hour. And your antenna should go up if for four hours her motor block does not subside. So uh, remember, you have a window period of just eight hours for uh, spinal decompression. So be very, very cautious about these three factors. Thank you. Hand over to Anju for her comments. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, indeed, uh, heartiest congratulations to the entire team of ISA, led by Dr. Bhimeshwar, sir, and Dr. Bajwa. Very well 
thought of series and an excellent talk, Dr. Jaya. Um, indeed, ma'am has highlighted one of uh, all the important points up there. What I would like to say is that uh, remember that these are mothers who have a high potential of getting into, as ma'am said, intracranial hemorrhage being one of the most leading causes of death for these eclamptic mothers. So it's very pertinent that we catch our mothers early. And the best way to do it is to have some form of you know, monitoring and early warning scores in your labor floor so that we are able to pick them up early and do not allow them to deteriorate to a point of eclampsia. So employing something called a modified early warning um, score, which is obstetrically modified to suit your obstetrical population, is a good way to give you red flags so that you know that your mothers are indeed now deteriorating. The blood pressures are rising and we need to control them very well. That is how a peripartum physician uh, comes into a role, not only in the intraoperative and postoperative, but in the in, in the labor floors. So that is where our roles are as, uh, as obstetric anesthesiologist. That's uh, one point that I would like to highlight. And another is to remember that more often than not, the indication for cesarean section in these mothers have to be an obstetric indication and not just because the blood pressure is high or something, or she's seizing. If the mother is seizing or there are issues, we really need to you know, look at the AVC and stabilize her and rather than just shift her to the operating room. Remember, even if she's apparently looking normal airway, there is a physiologically difficult airway and also a lot of edema up in the airways. So you have to always be wary of uh, and this aspect if you decide to go in for general anesthesia. So these are a few points. I think there are a lot of questions down there, uh, which would be interesting to discuss at the end of the session. I hand over the mic to Dr. Poonam. Thank you. Take <clears throat> questions later on, but thank you so much uh, to both of you for giving so practical uh, tips regarding the end organ perfusion. And as a, we should work as a peripartum physician and know the MUSE uh, score and everything else. So I now request uh, Dr. Sharad Kumar to uh, start the next session, which is the cracking the scientific dilemma. Uh, thank you, Dr. Poonam. And before that, I would like to invite one of our eminent personality of our society, Dr. Sweta Mughal. And uh, Dr. Sweta, hello, ma'am. Hello, Dr. Sweta, are you there, ma'am? Yeah, Shweta, ma'am, is there because she has just commented, uh, commented in the chat box. That's very nice. So, ma'am is the associate consultant in anesthesia at the Fortis Escorts Hospital, Faridabad, uh, Haryana. And she is the author of the topic which we are going to discuss is the conversion of liver epidural anesthesia to analgesia for cesarean sections, which was published in the World Federation of Society of Anesthesiologists, uh, Anesthesia, and uh, as tutorial for of the week. So I would like to invite Dr. Sweta to please say a few words, then we will move on to. I request to please unmute her. She is muted. Yeah, I'll make her co host. Just a minute. We can start with the uh, we can start with the program uh, and then at the end she will be able to speak. Okay, so I request Dr. Poonam to share the case scenario. Okay. Everybody talks about how to have a successful labor epidural, but the problems that we face in our day-to-day -day life is a failed epidural, and that is why this crisp series is going to be really interesting with good points at the end of the session. So uh, fortunately, we don't have to discuss a hypothetical case series here. This is a real patient that I, uh, uh, happened to me a few days back. She was a 26 years old primary with a labor epidural, which I placed at 9.30 a.m. with three centimeters of cervical dilatation. Uh, after which she received an infusion of ropivacaine 0.15% at 5 ml per hour. So this is the usual infusion that I start for all my labor epidural patients. She had adequate pain relief. The VAR score was less than two. The patient was happy and nothing is as satisfactory as seeing a patient happy and fall asleep in front of you. However, just a minute. At 12.30 p.m., the patient complained of intense pain. The obstetrician who came to assess her revealed that there is probably a obstructed labor that the patient is going into. And she decided to take her up for emergency LACS at 1 p.m. after proper preparation. So she was not a category one section. When I assess her, the patient I saw is wincing in pain and is restless. 
now i am really unsure if the catheter is really in place or is it migrated so what do i do next uh, dr sharad kumar so this is a case scenario which we face routinely in our practice yes dr pula uh, for sharing thank you for sharing very interesting case scenario and i hope uh, and i think uh, we are going to discuss a lot of things about this how we are going to manage for this i would like to invite dr ravindra and dr manisha uh, about their opinion what they are going to do for this case suppose this happened to them what is their approach so dr ravindra and dr manisha i request each of you to please share your thoughts and you have 8 minutes each so we start yes, with, starting with the dr ravindra yes dr sharad uh, good evening everyone i am dr ravindra from shimoga uh, uh, let me congratulate the entire isa team uh, led by dr bhimeshwar dr bajwa and, and all and uh, my um, sincere thanks to uh, dr sunanda ma'am and uh, everyone in the in the floor so we have um, you know all of us who are practicing the uh, labor analgesia do face this problem once in uh, at least once in uh, uh, six months or one year it's it, it just happens uh, but how to go about is a question so we have let me share my screen host has disabled my participant screen sharing can i can somebody do something about it i can't share my screen just a minute I, sir sir you can share right now yeah yes sir yes sir yeah the failure of conversion of labor epidural analgesia to a surgical anesthesia for an emergency lscs so we have a very good catheter working well and 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 the obstetrician decides for a cesarean section and we want to convert it into a, a surgical anesthesia we fail to it, it just does not happen now how do we define it a failed conversion of epidural anal uh, analgesia to surgical anesthesia should only be declared when you have given a sufficient dose of the local anesthetic epidurally and a sufficient time is given say at least about 20 ml of the local anesthetic mix that you are uh, practicing and at least 20 minutes is left before declaring that my epidural health is not working so this is the uh, minimum basic minimum thing now the question is when you have declared that your epidural is not working what next now how to go about there is only one one important point to be remembered to decide on what is to be done what is the mode of the, the progress is that when you recognize the time of recognizing the failure is most important supposing it is either before or after the skin incision if you have made the skin incision already and then you recognize that it is the epidural is not working or you have recognized it much before that let me take up the first issue the, the you have, you have made the skin incision and after that you have recognized here again there are two situations two clinical situations the first situation is that the surgeon puts an incision the moment the incision is put the patient starts complaining of pain now this is definitely a low dermatomal level of uh, labor epidural of the epidural conversion now this is actually it, this should not happen because you should not allow the surgeon to put an incision before you have confirmed that the analgesic level is a dermatomal level at least is sufficiently high now this will be all the time most of the times it is sharp pain excruciating so you need to stop the surgery and you have no other choice but to go ahead and convert it into a, a general anesthesia because you have already put the incision the second one is the incision the surgical incision was skin incision was painless the dermatomal level was 
sufficiently good, was fairly good. And he opens the, the a surgeon opens the uh, rectus sheath. And the, at the time of opening the peritoneum, the patient feels the pain. Now, there are two different types of pain at the, at the level of the peritoneum. One is a sharp pain again. Now, this sharp pain, if it is there, and the second one is pressure or a sort of, uh, you know, the uh, it's, a, it's a sort of pressure symptom. Now, <clears throat> if it is a sharp pain, you need to stop the surgery and then convert it into a general anesthesia. If it is pressure, then, or a sort of discomfort, then you have the choice of maybe giving a, a large dose of a local, uh, sorry, uh, a narcotic in the form of fentanyl, 100 micrograms IV, 100 my, even up to 100 mics of IV fentanyl before the extraction of baby is also safe from the point of view of uh, the neonate. It has been proved uh, beyond doubt. And now with a narcotic, with a narcotic, if she is comfortable, you can go ahead. And if she is uncomfortable, even with a narcotic, you need to go ahead and uh, convert it into a, a general endotracheal anesthesia. Uh, what is the role of IV ketamine? It is very highly uh, controversial. People are using it. But in an obstetric patient with a, an unsecure airway, whether you can use, it, use ketamine or not is a highly controversial topic. That is why I will just not comment on that. I will leave it at that point itself. Now, supposing if it is before skin incision, that means you are very careful. You have examined the patient well. You have given the top up and the level is inadequate, that the block is inadequate. Now, you have, I'll go a one step behind. You know, I will definitely go one step behind and examine my you examine my catheter beforehand. That means while I have given an epidural and for labor analgesia and the patient is for labor analgesia. Now at that level, at that point in time, if the catheter is non-function, if it is a poorly functioning catheter, I will always troubleshooting. See, there are many ways of troubleshooting. Pull the catheter by one centimeter, and and uh, you know charge the catheter give a little larger dose give a higher volume there could be obstetric causes there are many you <laughs> troubleshoot that discuss with the obstetrician or, or if nothing is working just go and recite the catheter now you must make your epidural catheter functioning when you have given a labor epidural now supposing after troubleshooting also it could be a well-functioning catheter or it could be a poorly functioning catheter. And at this point in time, the surgeon decides for an emergency cesarean section. Now, if, the, if it is a poorly functioning catheter before I nicely troubleshoot it, I will not charge this catheter at all. I will not charge it and say that my catheter has not worked afterwards. Rather, if it's a well-functioning catheter, I'll charge with a full dose of the local anesthetic for cesarean section. My choice of the local anesthetic is 2% lignocaine with, with adrenaline, with bicarb, soda bicarb, with fentanyl. Uh, eight in, the, in the ratio of 8 is to 1 is to 1. Oh. 8 ml, 1 ml, 1 ml. And I have charged it. Now, if it works well, fine. If I'll proceed with surgery. If it doesn't work well, and if it is a poorly functioning catheter, now is the time. I'll pull out the catheter in either situation. Either it is a, from the beginning, poorly functioning catheter, or it's a poorly functioning catheter after I charge it. I'll pull out the catheter and use some alternate neuraxial techniques. I will tell you about the alternate neuraxial techniques a little later. Now, if these, if they are working well, proceed with surgery, and if, it is poorly functioning again, then of course, we don't have anything else to do but for, to use general anesthesia. If nothing works, of course, general anesthesia is always there. And all of us know why this particular piece of equipment is called a mask, you see. It just masks all our deficiencies. Spinal fails, mask it. Epidural fails, mask it. We block fails, mask it. We all know it very well. Now, the type of the alternate neuraxial blocks 
which I'm, I was talking about depends on the urgency of the situation. How urgent I need to hand over my patient to the surgeon. Now, the, on this basis, we have to decide on the alternate neuraxial techniques. Now, we have four options. First thing, whatever be the uh, neuraxial technique you're thinking of, pull out your poorly functioning epidural catheter, first thing. And then you have, you can do a repeat epidural, you can do a single shot spinal, you can do a combined spinal epidural, or you can use a continuous spinal. These are the four options we have. Now, let me go to the last option, the continuous spinal. These, the sets for continuous spinal are sparsely available in India. The higher possibility of neuraxial infections, our you know, our less expertise with the continuous spinal, all of them say that they are, this is not a very good choice for us. Except in one, only one indication wherein you have your, your alternate neuraxial technique is one of the epidurals and you do an accidental dural puncture at that time, point in time. You, what you do is you thread your epidural catheter intrathecally and use it as a continuous spinal. That's the only indication. Barring that, in all other situations, the first three are the ones which can be chosen. Now, one by one, let, let me go. Repeat epidural, of course, is a fairly good technique, but there are certain problems. The first problem is that once my epidural has not worked, the same possibility, the same reasons could fail my second catheter as well. So that is why repeat epidural is not a very good choice. And there is one more is confusion about the dose requirement. See, because I have already given a large dose of my epidural. Now, how much to uh, dose? Small incremental doses of the drug has to be used. Possibility of local anesthetic toxicity is always there. So use a relatively safe local anesthetic in the form of lignocaine with adrenaline. Slow. Here, when you do all these things, time is a real constraint. Do, do, do. Any time is, 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 is an important constraint, then you don't use this at all. Can't do this when the time is a real constraint. General anesthesia has to be induced if oh. this also fails. Now, the second choice is single shot spinal. There are a lot of advantages of single shot spinal. Number one, all of us, the, everyone in this in this floor, there are more than some 380 people now, and all of them agree with me that we are all very, very proficient and pretty confident in our spinals. That's the first and the foremost reason why we can use this single shot spinal. The second one is, this is a more surer technique than our epidural is, because it has a sure end point. The CSF drips back in, in the needle, and that's a very sure uh, you know, end point and can be done very, very rapidly, almost as fast as, or in some situations, even much faster than inducing a general anesthetic, we can finish a, a single short spinal. So that is a great advantage for us. So, but there are a few problems with it. Problem number one is, we have already given an epidural dose. Now this epidural dose, epidural drug, would have, you know, it would be staying in the epidural compartment. Now, when we go ahead and put the needle again, if we use the same uh, level for the, uh, for some reason, now, you know, the, the liquid that we have put in the epidural space might drop back and think that we think that it is, a, it is our spinal. And that time, if we load the drug into the epidural space, it fails. So the, what we can do is use one space above or one space below to choose our single shot spinal. The second problem is the epidural space is filled with a lot of fluid now because we have loaded, we have charged the epidural catheter, at least 20 ml of the local anesthetic is there. And that is, you know, it's a large volume. When that happens, the epidural space compresses the subarachnoid space. The CSF, you know, moves above and below, the si spinal CSF volume itself is slightly low. And that is the reason why when we give the subsequent, our subsequent dose, 
epidural volume ext extension effect would make the higher block than what is expected of. So when I say what is a higher block, if you have given a large epidural dose in the last 30 minutes, reduce the dictum is reduce the dose of your spinal anesthetic. Now, how much to reduce? When I say reduce, how much to reduce? Two thirds of the calculated dose are up to nine milligrams of bupivacaine heavy. That is 1.8 ml of uh, bupivacaine heavy is reasonably safe. <clears throat> but you are always risking a low, low block again. When you are giving a small dose, you might develop a low block. That means that the spinal also is low. You may have to induce general anesthesia. So you are risking that. So what if my spinal also fails? Of course, general anesthesia is always there. The third choice is the combined spinal epidural. There are quite a few advantages. The onset of action is quite rapid, like spinal anesthesia, because there is a spinal component. Flexibility of the extension of level of the block as well as duration of the block. Now, supposing I give, we can afford to give a small dose of the spinal anesthetic so that the block level will not become a very high block. And then I can use my epidural catheter to increase or to, to extend the level of the block. It can be extended to post-op analgesia as well. So this, and one more important thing that it is doing is that my spinal needle tests the epidural catheter. For example, what we do normally in CSC technique with a needle through needle technique, we identify the epidural space and then a spinal needle is passed through the epidural needle puncture the dura also and get the CSF, right? Now, supposing if this is the tip of the level of the tip of the epidural uh, needle and within about five to eight millimeters, if I can get the CSF flow nicely, this tests my epidural catheter, epidural position. So this is one other advantage of my CSC technique. So for failed epidural conversion, my choice of main management depends on the time available for me to convert. If it is less than 20 minutes, I'll go ahead and give a spine, single shot spinal anesthetic. And if it is more than 20 minutes, I use a combined spinal, uh, 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 spinal epidural. I am more fond of combined spinal epidural for conversion uh, failures to be managed because I'm somehow I'm very much uh, probably, uh, probably I'm a little more addicted to epidurals probably. Barring that, CSC is a very good technique. If there is failure of any of these two techniques, and of course, we have no other choice but to induce general anesthesia. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, thank you. Sir. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Poonam, please. Yes, yes. Thank yeah. you, sir. Uh, may I now request Dr. Manisha, madam, to please no, share. No, 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 no. Manisha Shembekar, ma'am, please. Yes. Generally, when we have a debate or a pros and cons session, we have arguments, endless arguments with no conclusion. Uh, probably this is a situation where either can be right uh, and we can get a true practical tip towards the end as to what exactly has to be done in such a situation. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is a really a, a different um, situation uh, altogether. Just because Sir has so nicely expressed that I think I'm at loss of words as to what to say after him. Uh, I should have requested Manisha to give me give the talk <laughs> earlier than <laughs> Dr. Ravinder Sir. Uh, Uh, I, I bring greetings from my hospital uh, and uh, my parent body AOA. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Bhimeshwar, President ISA, and uh, Dr. Sukhvinder Singh Bajwa, now honorary secretary. 
the program coordinators, Dr. Uh, Manoj, Dr. Kishan, and my dear friend, Dr. Manisha, and, uh, Dr. Poonam, Dr. Sharad, uh, and uh, how can I forget uh, the chairperson, Sunanda ma'am and Anju ma'am, uh, who are uh, there to back me up if required. Uh, so this is the situation that Poonam has uh, given us. That uh, the Manisha, ma'am, sorry to interrupt you. Could you make it as a full screen, please? Just a moment. Yeah. It's it's full screen on my uh, laptop. Because we can see the next slides also. Uh, okay. Just a moment. Manisha, you can unshare and share again here. Yeah. Is it okay now? No. no. Go to slideshow on the top bar. Manisha, are you able to go on the next slide? To go on to the second slide? I don't think so. Yeah, now yeah. it is okay. Now, yes. it's, okay. Yeah. Yes. now it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Just a minute. So uh, the pain relief was good until very recently and patient was very happy. Uh, however, now uh, the decision for operative delivery has been taken. This is the situation. Now, I'm uh, when I'm faced with this situation, I have three options. Either I top it up again to obtain surgical anesthesia by increasing the concentration because it was going with a very uh, low concentration at uh, only 5 ml per hour. Or I go for uh, spinal anesthesia and of course, general anesthesia is always an option. Now, if I want to top it up with the epidural, uh, with the anesthetic dose of the epidural, uh, what would my options be? I usually prefer 2% lidocaine uh, with fentanyl and uh, a soda bicarb to alkanine is it. However, uh, bupivacaine or ropivacaine can be uh, given with or without fentanyl. If, uh, choice depends on the urgency of the section and the institutional protocol. After giving an incremental doses of the full uh, anesthetic dress, I'll wait for 15 minutes to ensure that the uh, analgesia is progressing and uh, whether there is a separate head. And uh, this will be assessed by loss of sensation to touch or hold, mostly do it by touch, until the T5 dermatomes uh, at least, and along with it, the dense motor block. Uh, the 15 minutes have elapsed, but there is no pain relief. So there is a dilemma. What should I do? Should I remove the epidural catheter and proceed for spinal anesthesia or give general anesthesia if it has been a, if it were a category one section with fetal distress? So as we all know, this epidural top up can fail. I have given the dose. She, she may not have a surgical anesthesia as yet. And uh, Royal College of Anesthetists states that the conversion rate should be less than 15% in category one and less than 5% in category two sections. This was decided just to maintain the uh, standard uh, procedures. However, the incidence is said to be as high as 21%, especially in training institutes uh, where the trainees are practicing in. And uh, they have said that uh, whatever said and done, decision to delivery interval should be less than 30 minutes. So uh, what can be the risk factors for conversion failure? greater number of unscheduled top-ups if she is uh, requiring during the process of labor because she was all right until now. So maybe uh, that was uh, not the case. Uh, increased pain proceeding towards of cesarean section. This is uh, the case that we are uh, dealing with now. And uh, management by non obstetric anesthetists is uh, said to increase the risk factor because they'll, uh, the adjustment of dose may not be as uh, good as it should have been. And of course, the urgency of section. Now, uh, the decision delivery interval should be less than 30 minutes. And what are the factors that affect this uh, interval? Um, 
most importantly shifting to or they have decided that she should be taken for a section but shifting the patient from labor room to or takes some time and we know how much it can be surgical readiness of the entire team time to achieve anesthesia and time taken for the surgeon from incision to delivery so role of anesthesiologist is limited only uh, to this part that is time to achieve anesthesia so uh, every time we may not be in a hurry because there there are other factors which are not under our control uh, the literature says that in such situation primary goal of anesthesia for c section is early decision making which should be done by the obstetrician shorter decision delivery interval as i have already told and a provision for proper neonatal resuscitation should be de uh, there uh, beforehand uh, when the baby is delivered so anesthetic technique is not the sole factor now to uh, the way to get started is to quick talking and begin doing the, the case at hand what are my options either i manipulate the catheter give cac give spinal anesthesia or of course general anesthesia is the uh, ultimate uh, uh, thing that I, that can be done if everything else fails. So pros and cons, as Sir has very nicely described, but uh, I'll again uh, re-emphasize that manipulation or replacement of the catheter uh, is good because you can extend the block intraoperatively as required if the uh, block level is inadequate. However, it will take longer time to perform, especially if the anesthesiologist is inexperienced in doing so. So an experienced anesthesiologist like Ravindra sir can very well do it. Uh, so uh, in safe hands, it can be tried and it should be tried if there is not an urgency. CSE, yes, it's very good. It, can, it gives you fast onset and uh, reduced dose for spinal and can extend uh, the block intraoperatively. However, again, longer time to perform. You have already given an epidural and again, you are going to do that. So uh, it's uh, it may be difficult. And um, all said and done, untested epidural catheter is really uh, one issue that has to be addressed. Now coming to general anesthesia. Mm. Uh, which was always uh, given when in category one sections earlier in olden days, uh, fetal distress hai GA de do. So advantage I see only is fast onset of action. And other disadvantages are we all know accidental awareness, difficult intubation, failed intubation, risk of aspiration, which have uh, led to so many maternal deaths, uh, post-op nausea, vomiting, post-operative pain, and above all, a depressed APGAR score. So uh, the whole purpose of uh, delivering the baby uh, fast and uh, rapidly is defeated if the neonat is having a depressed APGAR score. Now coming to spinal anesthesia, which is our, our favorite, and we are very well versed with doing it. Uh, and we all know the advantages. You can do it very quickly, fast onset of action of the drug, low risk of last because very small doses can be given. That is advantages, as Sir has uh, said that uh difficulty in obtaining csf because the epidural space is filled with the fluid that we have all been given there is always a dilemma to select the dose L little less dose and the block may be inadequate and a little higher dose and it, it is the risk of high or total spinal so this dilemma remains and it uh, all depends on uh how the situation is and who is dealing with it now we zero down to general versus spinal anesthesia so general anesthesia in obstetric population is becoming only increasingly rare only in certain elective cases uh, where there is coagulopathies or uh, uh, eclampsia or uh, these things. Otherwise, we do not give it. So neuraxial block has become the gold standard uh, because exposure to GA triples the odds of maternal deaths and doubles the odds of perinatal deaths in low resource settings. That is uh, the study which uh, has come up with this and cesarean section under GA always have a higher uh, blood loss than uh, spinal anesthesia and rapid sequence spinal anesthesia has been described which uh, now we should be practiced. This uh, was an article published in 2021 about the current role of GA for cesarean delivery and they said, uh, have said that it should be avoided because of high incidence of perioperative mortality. Now, uh, coming to rapid sequence spinal anesthesia versus general anesthesia, this was an article uh, and, uh, in JOACC published in 2016. And uh, rapid sequence spinal anesthesia was first described by Kinsella et al. Uh, in uh, 2003. So, uh, what is the idea? It's the 
anesthetist is waiting in the OR, uh, gown and glove uh, while the patient is being wheeled in the operation room. Uh, keep the drug combination simple or give only bupivacaine uh, so that uh, the dilemma of mixing the drug and how much uh, of the age of the drug is to be taken is avoided. Limit the number of attempts and, and the most experienced anesthetist is the one who will be performing it. Preferably in sitting position because uh, identification of midline uh, is uh, better in sitting position and you uh, uh, can keep the patient in sitting position for some time and make her supine later on so as to avoid a high block. And uh, 15 degree head down tilt is suggested uh, to uh, maintain uh, the uh, level of block. And of course, left uterine uh, displacement whenever you make the patient supine. So it may look very easy. Uh, however, we should uh, prevent the situation from occurring that you have to rush uh, from uh, labor room to OR and do something very fast, you should always anticipate that this patient may uh, land up for cesarean delivery so that you have time to prepare yourselves. So how do we do that? It can be done by active management of labor epidurals. That means you should have active communication with the obstetric team. Uh, whether the, uh, pay, the progress of labor is as per schedule or she is lagging behind or uh, the fetal heart rate is reassuring or otherwise. Uh, so the communication with the obstetric team and the nursing staff is uh, a good idea. And we should assess the epidural block, the quality of block and the uh, number of additional top box uh, which are required. Are they uh, more frequent or unscheduled? That uh, again has to be kept in mind uh, and uh, to alert ourselves that we may uh, have to go for um, this patient may land up for C-section and maybe my uh, catheter is not working as it should have been. So we should anticipate the operative delivery, optimize the epidural block beforehand and uh, replace the poorly functioning catheter early on so that uh, the situation can be avoided. Now, as uh, sir has very nicely depicted that you have given the uh, total dose of local anesthetics and uh, the incision has been given where patient is initially, she did not have any pain, but as the incision is given, there is sharp pain during uh, cesarean section and that suggests inadequate law. Now, what should be done? Uh, IV supplementation of anesthetic agents, yes, fentanyl and some people say uh, ketamine can be given, although that remains con controversial. But in such situation, one has to be ready with GA with endotracheal intubation at all times because inadequate anesthesia may cause post-traumatic stress disorders. And uh, it has been reported that 89% of parturians have uh, experienced moderate psychological trauma and 11% had permanent trauma because of this ordeal and uh, litigations are, uh, are increased because of inadequate pain relief during sections. So uh, to summarize, what would I do in this situation? I will, uh, since it is a category two section, I will try to manipulate the catheter on the on, inject one third to half of the anesthetic dose incrementally, uh, wait for the block for 10 minutes. Is there some relief of pain uh, now or there is no relief at all? If there is some relief of pain, maybe I'll give more uh, drug and see whether the block is um, taking uh, its effect. If there is no relief at all, that means uh, the uh, catheter has um, migrated and then I'll prepare for spinal anesthesia. Uh, maybe I'll turn the patient to natural decubitus position and perform a rapid sequence spinal anesthesia. Mm, the dose, uh, they say, it should be reduced to 20% of the uh, dose that we have uh, decided. So 1.5 to 1.8 ml of 0.5% bifurcan uh, with a little head down tilt should be given and uh, left uterine displacement uh, after the patient is not supine. So would you not give GA at all? Yes, you have to give GA. I remember one patient uh, during the course of labor was working properly, but there was profuse bleeding and I had no time to do anything and spread institution. So uh, it has to be given when it is. But uh, I would like to emphasize here, uh, why should we avoid GA? Uh, it is only for the standalone maternity hospitals, not uh, the institutions or corporates where you have very uh, good staff to assist you or other uh, people. Uh, so many people are there uh, in case. Um, here, the staff is less. 
who is not well versed with general anesthesia policy section drug errors are more likely to occur during emergency sections uh, so you are uh, holding the mask you are telling someone to inject the drug so you don't know what uh, is being done and how much drug is being given and especially in uh, emergency situations then this can happen and uh, post operative analgesia always remains a challenge in these situations so i think uh, it doesn't sound like a dilemma at all now Thank you, uh, Manisha, ma'am. Thank you, Ravindra sir and Manisha, ma'am, for the excellent deliberation. And uh, you won't believe that what I did to my case is actually a combination of what both of you just explained to us. Now, um, the similarity in the thought process uh, between uh, both sir and madam just re-emphasize uh, that there is a simple solution to a not so uncommon problem that we face in our day-to-day -day life. So what I did in my patient is that I went and I confirmed. Now, there's no way to confirm that it is really in the epidural space once it is inside the space. So what I confirmed that it has not migrated into the intrathecal space or into the intravascular compartment. That is what I ensured first. This is what I did as madam suggested. I used the drugs that sir has suggested. So I generally use lignocaine, epinephrine and bicarbonate solution. So 50% of it is what I gave in the pre-operative in, in the labor room, which is just adjacent to the OT and then shifted her with total monitoring inside the OT and then gave rest of the drug. It acted very well. I uh, confirmed the level sensory motor and then we went ahead with the cesarean section as planned. So now we are open to questions. I think Dr. Sharad and uh, myself would now take up the questions from the chat box. Uh, Dr. Sharad Kumar, sir, would you please begin with the uh, question, uh, that, question? Yes, Dr. Poonam, thank you. So we will begin with Dr. Jaya Lalwani. Uh, hello, Dr. Jaya, are you there? There are a few questions in the chat box. Hope you have gone yes, through. Sir. And I am repeating the question. The first question was, after seizure episode, how early we can go give the spinal? This was the question. Yeah, once the patient becomes conscious, only then we can think about uh, giving spinal. The unconscious patient, uh, we cannot give spinal. So how much time uh, should there be, you know, between the last conversion and before we give the spinal is what a common question in the chat box was. Is there any time period that should be elapsing in between? I didn't come across any time period. Uh, I would request Sunanda ma'am and Anju ma'am if they have any time limits. Can I comment? If yes, the please, 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 please. Yeah. See, there, there is nothing like well, how much time. And uh, uh, as you properly put it, Dr. Jaya, in eclampsia, to uh, give a spinal anesthetic, any other re regional anesthetic as such, there are only a two, three um, baselines are required. Number one, this patient, as you rightly said, should be conscious. The level of consciousness is very, very important. If the patient has seized in the next last 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes, and she is fully conscious, there is no reason why you should not give a spinal at all. That's number one. And number two, you have completely assessed the her coagulation status. Platelet counts and the coagulation status is fine. These are the two things are fine. You can definitely go ahead and give a, a spinal anesthetic. And the third thing is if she is hemodynamically stable. Unstable. Yes. yes. And a point of caution here that if she has just recently ceased, there would be a period of post-ictal post drowsiness and sedation. So you will have to carefully assess her, uh, very rightly pointed out by all my experts, is to assess her consciousness, her hemodynamic stability, and the trend of platelet counts. That's very important. Not a single platelet count. Thank you. So is there any role of focus or say the optic nerve sheet diameter that is being done to rule out increase in the ICP so that we can have some uh, parameter in our hands to rule out and raise ICP so that we can go ahead with the spinal at least as far as the medical legal uh, is concerned? So if there's raised ICP, then there definitely has to be some symptoms. Again, that comes to the GCS scoring and the level of consciousness. There cannot so, be raised ICP without many manifestations in the clinical status of the patient. That was one of the question. That is there any role of ONSD? There is a role of ONSD to look at the progression, to prognosticate and look at the kind of treatment, you know, uh, how the patient is progressing and responding to the treatment, not as a guide to put a spinal anesthesia. That has to be very clear. Uh, Dr. Jaya, next question is from Dr. Jyoti. 
and yeah. she is asking if the platelet count is seventy thousand with the range LFT and RFT, and she had convulsion two hours ago, uh, had received magnesium sulfate. What should be the approach? And next part is the what is the risk of post-operative eclampsia if, if we have extubated the patient? Can you elaborate on this point? She has uh, seventy thousand platelets and uh, the range LFT RFT convulsions two hours ago. Yeah, and received to, magnesium sulfate. Yeah, she is to be taken for uh, section. What is the question? Yes, she has. She to wants to. Be, yes, yes, to be taken. Wants to undergo section. Yeah. Yes, so exactly. again, uh, if she has convulsions two hours ago, then we have to. Uh, the platelets are borderline. So regarding the platelets, we can surely go for a single shot spinal anesthesia. But she had convulsions two hours ago. So again, we have to assess the level of consciousness, the hemodynamic status. Okay. Yeah. Can I add something more here? Yes. Hello. Yes. Dr. Sharad. Yes, shall sir. I, shall I add something here? Yeah, please, sir. Please there go ahead. One sir. query in the chat box also. It's regarding the convulsions and scissors in a eclamptic preeclampsia or eclampsia and a convulsion in a normal person. The post ictal phase, it start, they always remain there for 24 to 48 hours. Definitely the conscious level is there. The conscious level you assume its patient is responding to you. There is no harm in giving the spinal in such cases as such, there are no guidelines in the uh, communication between the anesthesia and the neurology society where you can really establish a safe period depending upon the duration of convulsion in the spinal. In the eclamptic, preeclamptic patient, the cause of spinal itself is a, this one. Cause of seizure itself is a pregnancy. When the section is over, the majority of the stimuli is already taken care of. Yes. In such cases, I don't think so. There is uh, another need for uh, whatever you can call uh, assessment again. That uh, the spinal was not given or something like that. It's the stimuli is already over. So uh, levels of magnesium sulfate you assess in the body, how much magnesium levels are there. I think it's a safe period. The chances are there. But the stimuli are different in the preeclamptic patient and the normal patient who have got the neurological stimuli. And the platelet functioning, ma'am, it's not just 70,000. This is a quantitative. It's a qualitative important because qualitative, we have to go for the, all the tests for elastography and other platelet function tests so that we can assume that spinal is safe even in spite of the deranged liver functions here. So I think all these factors can be taken care of in a tertiary care institution. And if such patients are encountered in the because we are aiming for the practice, practicing anesthesiology, such scenarios are encountered in the peripheries. It's better to shift these patients to the tertiary care rather than contributing to the morbidity and mortality of such patients. Yeah. Right. And, uh, can I add something? Since Dr. Bajwa uh, recommended shifting to a tertiary care center, it is very, very pertinent that when you decide to shift for a tertiary care center, please take care of the ABCs ensure that you know you have enough expert help or along the way maybe an anesthesiologist can accompany the patient and that you have forewarned or in pre-informed the receiving institute you know that i am saying this because we recently received a, a peripartum patient who was unaccompanied the abcs were not taken care of en route the patient loses her airway and by the time she reaches your tertiary care center there's hardly anything you can do in a hypoxic patient who has arrested long back so very important that you stabilize your patient, have enough resources at least to stabilize your ABCs en route. That's extremely important. Exactly, madam. Doctor. Well said. So, hello, no. Jaya, yes, there is sir. one more question. What yes. are the indications of general anesthesia in eclamptic patients apart from low platelet count? Although you have explained, but uh, can you? Yeah, uncontrolled seizures. Unconscious okay. patient. Unconscious. And also a patient who already has pulmonary edema or congestive heart failure, these patients should also be given general anesthesia. And remember, many a times, uh, severe preeclampsia and cardiomyopathy will coexist. So you need to evaluate your patient before you rush into any of the choices. Yeah, if time permits, you should always go for the focus. We should do that. Yeah. And it's coming in a weak way. So we should always prepare for ourselves with the use of ultrasound. Should start using it either in the labor room or in the operation theater also. So it works with this. 
So labor floors always will have an ultrasound, whether you're in a private setup or in an institutional setup. Yeah. yeah. The anesthesiologist must pick up those probes from and you know evaluate these patients. Yeah. It is time to move on. Another thing is postpartum, we must need to be vigilant because postpartum seizures are pretty often. And more often than not, because you might have done some kind of vigorous uh, you know, intravenous resuscitation because say there was a PPH, the levels of magnesium do drop down and therefore you need to ensure that one, uh, you need to monitor these patients and two, that handovers between teams, preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative, especially with magnesium are taken care of very carefully. And just to add to that, uh, Anju, what you were talking about, uh, we should not stop the magnesium sulfate in the uh, just before giving your general anesthesia or uh, spinal anesthesia, citing the fact that it can lead to uterine atony. Just remember that uh, it has a period of five hours. And if you stop your magnesium sulfate immediately, it's not going to have in first any effect on the uterine tonicity. And secondly, you are precipitating a postpartum eclamptic seizure in these patients. So just remember, you should not stop your magnesium sulfate. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Ravindra. Uh, sir, just one question uh, to Jaya, ma'am, before we... Uh, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, yeah. Please. Madam, there was one comment in the chat, uh, chat box uh, asking about press in eclampsia patient. Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah, it is a, a, neuro, a neuroradiologic condition. If a patient accompanies with help, uh, comes with a headache and a neuroophthalmic sign, so that is press. Matlarpi patient. We have to uh, assess the vital parameters and then plan for general anesthesia if it is coming for C section. So, uh, management of press is usually conservative, you know, like. You, you, you would, of course, take care of all the parameters of blood pressure control and uh, you know, it may be self limiting. Uh, it is self limiting, yeah. yeah. And it's a cerebral. It's not it's that common, common also. also. So, mannitol is something that you give and uh, sedatives, that is all you give. And cortisone, some do give corticosteroids also. And you'll find that it settles down by itself. There are some neurocognitive deficiencies which may linger on for some time. But uh, after a year, you'll find that the neuroradiological white matter lesions disappear in these patients. So, so if the one does not settle patients. down on its own, it is itself a red flag sign that probably the patient is not having press, but it is more serious neurological feature that she is presenting with. And that has to be ruled out probably with the CT MRI. So that is a red flag sign. If it does not subside, it is not press probably. So Jaya Madam has emphasized beyond doubt that spinal should be the standard of care for a preeclampsia patient provided there is no absolute contraindication to spinal, which we uh, discussed in depth. Uh, sir, uh, would, you, uh, would we now go towards the next session? Before that, I would like to um, introduce and call upon Dr. Shweta Madam, uh, Shweta Mogul Madam. Uh, can she be unmuted? We were unable to unmute her previously. Yeah, message. I'm unmuted. Yes. Welcome. Uh, thank you, yeah. madam. Welcome, thank welcome. you. Thank you. I'm honored to be here among all the experienced and senior faculties. Thank you, ISA, for the same. So uh, before discussing the management of failed conversion, I would like to bring into notice the importance of this topic. So once your conversion has failed, if you are giving GA, you can have failed intubation, you can have aspiration. If you're giving spinal, you can have high spinal. If you're giving repeat epidural, you can have local anesthetic systemic toxicity. So in this scenario, you can have all the serious complications related to obstetric anesthesia. So um, if you know the Society of Obstetric Anesthesiology and Perinatology from the US, they have conducted a project and looked upon the serious complications specifically related to the obstetric anesthesia. So among them, high spinal and unrecognized intrathecal catheter. These are the two most common serious complications of obstetric anesthesia. And 25% of these cases occur when we are converting labor epidural uh, analgesia to anesthesia. Uh, another, uh, uh, I would like to mention about the ASA closed claim analysis. So if you look on the, uh, look upon the medical legal claims against the obstetric anesthesiologist, the most frequent or the most common cause of medical legal claims is inadequate pain during cesarean delivery. 
and most of these cases occur when we are we have converted epidural analgesia to anesthesia and the epidural has not acted patient was in pain we have ignored that and they, they, these cases land up to the medical legal claims even though medical legal claims are more common in western now indian population is also getting very uh, fam, uh, aware of the medical legal uh, i mean the medical legal awareness is increasing so this is the uh, scenario or this is the situation one should not take up lightly as dr manisha has um, rightly pointed out about the uh, prevention and active management of labor epidurals so in this situation we can divide into two uh, classes one is the prevention so because all these complications can happen we have to prevent it so prevention you have to be actively involved it's not like we have given epidural and you don't know what is happening in the labor room so you have to be actively involved how your epidural is working uh, what is going on regarding the labor you uh, you talk with the uh, nurses their staff regarding the progress you talk with the obstetrician and you have any indication that this patient may land up into the cesarean section you have to check your catheter whether it is working or not if it is not working replace it early so that is the prevention and suppose this patient lands up a, uh, into a cesarean section your catheter was not uh, satisfactory during the epidural straight away do not top it up straight away remove and give spinal before topping it up second scenario you have already topped it up you have given the full dose for conversion and now you uh, have faced with fails uh, conversion your epidural is not working pain relief is not uh, surgical anesthesia has not achieved now what will you do so there are two situations whether the surgery has started as dr ravindra sir has already mentioned if the surgery has started you have to give gm if the surgery has not started you have option but the main pointer towards the decision making here is your category of the cesarean section if your category uh, of the cesarean section is category 1 that means you, are, you have emergency cesarean section you cannot wait you have already given the full dose of the epidural for that action to come you have waited for five maybe 5 10 minutes you cannot wait more in the category 1 cesarean section and you have to give general anesthesia in this case no other option if it is category 2 or category 3 cesarean section then you have other options then you can think you have other neuroaxial techniques so all already advantages and disadvantages risk of other techniques have been mentioned i would like to make some comments if you are giving if you are given full dose and your your there is category 2 or 3 it has not acted and if you have decided on spinal anesthesia there are two main risk it may either fail completely or it may have a high block so if you are giving a reduced dose there is no consensus on how much to reduce it if you are giving a reduced dose it may again fail if you are giving a normal dose it can even if it reduces you you can may uh, you may have a high spinal so in this case you i i prefer uh, with going ahead with a combined spinal epidural you may give a reduced dose and if it doesn't act if it is inadequate spinal you can always top it up and i will always have that 5 to 10 minutes of giving csc because it is a category 2 or category 3 if it was category 1 i would have straight away gone with ga about repeat epidural again it is a difficult and remember there is a risk of local anesthetic systemic toxicity we have given full dose and again you are placing a new epidural and giving a top up you always you can always exceed the dose and have toxicity uh, but still if you want to go ahead with epidural there is one uh, thing you can go you can give 2% uh, sorry 3% to chloroprocan i am not sure if it is available in india but uh, it is not available in our setup you can give 20 ml because it is a ester thing it is metabolized by cholinesterase and the risk of last is almost not there uh, third thing about continuous spinal analgesia although there is a risk of infection uh, there is one thing and we are not familiar but there is one indication where i would like to go ahead if you know you have you do not want to intubate this patient you may have a failed airway like if you are you, if you have a patient with morbid obesity you know you don't want to intubate this patient especially in this situation then uh, going with the combined uh, sorry com continuous spinal analgesia is easier uh, because this see we have already given full epidural volume your epidural space is filled with local anesthetic in this case we, if you are trying with cac you are trying with spinal it may be difficult it may take a little more time than usual but placing but putting uh, two he needle straight away in the intrathecal space 
and putting a, a intrathecal catheter is comparatively easier than this technique, especially in this situation. So if you do not want to, you know, if you do not want to intubate this patient, maybe this technique is preferable. There, I think there is only one indication for this thing. Um, also, I would like to make one comment. Uh, we are saying that uh, uh, the time duration since the last top up, if it was 30 minutes before the last top up, we assume that it may be safe to go with the spinal anesthetic. But the reports, uh, but if you if we see the uh, case reports of high spinal, because of spinal anesthetic given after fail, uh, fail, uh, uh, given after the uh, labor uh, top ups, the high spinal has been reported from forty minutes as much as high as sixty minutes. So even if you're uh, giving spinal uh, 60 minutes after the last top up there are still case reports of having high spinal so there is no consensus on time limit there is no consensus on the dose it's totally risk management strategy so if we look upon the um, rate of uh, failed intubation it is like roughly one in uh, 300 to one in 224 in obstetric anesthesia which is still high so uh, my preference would be still uh, go with uh, alternate neuroaxial technique provided we have the time. So, so basically, this is the situation all of us would like to avoid. So, prevention is the uh, best management, I feel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shweta. Dr. Sharad, can we go for the next questions? Yes, madam. So, next question can you ask from Dr. Ravindra? Yes. Uh, so, sir, there is a question in the chat box by Dr. Samir and is asking which spinal agent would you prefer to use uh, heavy bupivacaine or heavy levobupivacaine and why? For, for spinal anesthetic? For the epidural levons, I think or the spinal is spinal yes sir. For the yeah, spinal see, sir. See it, it just doesn't matter whichever is, is your choice. You know, whichever drug you are more familiar with, because you are in you are in a trouble situation, you use the drug which you are more familiar with. I would probably go ahead and give a 0.5 percent bupivacaine heavy um, for my spinal anesthetic. Thank you, sir. Yeah, sir, and for epidural, uh, Ravindra, sir. Uh, we mentioned uh, lignocaine with adrenaline. So that also has methyl paraben. So there are comments on the chat box. Is it really uh, safe to use methyl paraben into the epidural space? Yeah, you see, I, the, the point is that we have been using this for a long time. Whether it is safe or not, literature support, we still don't know. But in, in every institution in India, we are using lignocaine with adrenaline with um, bicarbonate and fentanyl. Uh, most places, of course, most places use lignoc adrenaline with bicarbonate and fentanyl may or may not be advised. Uh, and we use it for epidural top. And uh, for a, see, let me ask this, some 300 odd uh, people here. We all give epidural test dose. All of us give epidural test dose. 2% lignocaine with adrenaline, 3 cc of whatever standard preparation we are doing. Are we doing giving it every day? And that is what is being done. We are not making a fresh preparation of lignocaine play. Even the, uh, the preservative-free lignocaine with adrenaline, we are not mixing it and giving. Uh, is anyone doing it? No, sir. No. Yeah, so I think it is. I think it is reasonably safe. It should be acceptable. Yeah. Sharad sir, have, have I made my point clear, ma'am? Yes, Anisha, sir. Ma yes. Yes. Thank you, Sharad, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Doctor Manisha. Yes. Regarding the adding the soda by carb. Soda by carb, as you said, that it can be added. So, how much to be added? Can you explain in something about? Yeah, uh, usually one ml of soda by carb, 
uh, is given to alkalinize the uh, solution in with two percent lidocaine. With uh, ropivacaine or bupivacaine, it is caused precipitation, so it is not used with uh, uh, those Only with lignocaine we uh, can use soda bicarb. And it is one ml. If you give eight ml of two percent, then one ml of uh, soda bicarb, and uh, we usually give it with fentanyl, fifty mics. See, this... So that the block uh, is uh, fast, the onset of block is faster if you uh, alkalinize the solution. You know, this is uh, analgesia to surgical anesthesia conversion. Uh, our uh, uh, our erstwhile president of AOA, Dr. Sunil Pandya, has formed that, in, uh, he has formulated that formula 8 plus 1 plus 1 rule. Wherein lignocaine with adrenaline 2% 8 ml in a 10 ml syringe with 1 ml of soda bicarb 7.5%. We need to add 8.4%, what but most of the places we 7.5% is what is available. 1 ml of that plus 1 ml of fentanyl, which is 50 mics. So this mix is you know initially given 3 ml is given as a test dose, waited for a few minutes. Then give another 5 ml and then so when he completes this 10 ml then you know he will assess the level of the block and then he will load another 10 ml of 8 plus 1 plus 1 and in which he uses about 3 to 4 ml or 5 ml to maximum to complete the cesarean section. So it is about 15 ml of this mix 8 plus 1 plus 1 is what is used for one cesarean section. Yeah, it's clear, sir. Sir, it's a very interesting question. Recently, we are hearing a lot of things about the segmental spinal. Uh, so, suppose the epidural has failed. Is there any role of segmental spinal in these conditions, sir? Uh, your, any experience on this, sir? Or yeah, ma'am, you can also come in. Can I, can I answer this question? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, see, sir. See, segmental spinal is not for a cesarean section. Segmental spinal is for higher up blocks, whereas for cesarean section, we need a sacral involvement also. So what we need to use for cesarean sections is a heavy bupivacaine, wherein sacral sparing does not take place. We don't want sacral sparing. If sacral sparing is there, the, the, during cesarean section, there will be pain for the patient. So it is the heavy bupivacaine <laughs> with the conventional um, spinal itself is the choice for uh, spinal anesthetic. In yeah, we need a hyperbaric solution, not yes. an isobaric solution will help here because the sacral segments are difficult uh, to uh, get blocked. I would like to add something here that always remember that when you are doing a caesarean section, the visceral pain may not be only of pelvic origin. It may originate from other intra-abdominal structures and uh, where the nerve fibers, they are carried along with the afferent nerves, which enter the spinal cord at the level of T5. So remember, a segmental epidural or spinal is not going to be very effective here because there are so many nerve fibers coming up to T5. And, okay, one of them suggested that uh, pinprick or... Uh, Sensation to cold should be what should be used. But I would suggest that always use firm pressure. That is what you should uh, take home. Uh, that's a take home message for all of you that do not rely on pinprick because the sensitivity may be 98%, but the specificity goes down to 53% there. So if you use just the back of your ballpoint pen, just use pressure and find out if the block has gone up to T5. That will help solve many of your problems of incomplete analgesia. Can I add to this, ma'am? Yes, Dr. Shreda. Yeah, so uh, the level required for cesarean section is not T6, T8, it is T4. T4 to the first feeling of sharp sensation. So that means you start your um, sharp, 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 like pain prick, or any sharp uh, uh, sensation from the lumbosacral segment. And you come up and ask the patient, tell me when you first feel the sharp pain. 
it should be T4. If you uh, see, if you check the touch sensation, it would be a few dermatomes below the pinprick. And if you are having touch sensation at the T6, most of your cesarean section would be painless. So it is either first filling of sharp sensation to the T4 or absence of touch at the T6, that is your adequate level. In UK, if you, uh, when you are documenting the spinal level in your anesthesia record, if you have not documented it to, to the T4, you are liable to answer to the court. But I would like to suggest here that pinprick is not recommended. Pinprick mm -hmm. or uh, cold uh, alcohol swabs. <laughs> Yeah, cold is definitely not recommended. Even I think the pressure light. is the best way. Uh, yeah, the best. And light touch is what is recommended, ma'am. Yes. And when pressure when it says all point pen back, you just press it, and if the patient yes. sees it, means yes. the patient is not yet ready for you. Another thing is when when they say the level of the block up up to T four, it is. That means that. All segments below T4 should be blocked. So segmental cannot be used for cesarean section at all. Segmental. Up to T4, all segments. Correct. Ma'am, here one problem is there in the peripheries. You know, the intellectual level of the patient is very important. Mm -hmm. How they perceive the pain and how anesthesiologists perceive their a perception of pain, how they communicate with them, because many times even the light touch sensation is considered as pain because of anxiety of the obstetric, you know, this obstetric condition, the labor pains, the mother, or the parturient is already under so much stress that she may not be able to cooperate properly with the anesthesiologist or the surgeon. So here establishing a rapport by the anesthesiologist with the patient, mm -hmm. her intellectual level, her economic status, her all these uh, social behavioral pattern is very, very important, especially in our peripheries. Just yeah. to add. Yes, very true. Our village women would say no to every form of pain because they are so used to thinking that uh, an operation means pain. So, you know, that <laughs> amount of pain is nothing serious for them. But then when we, see, when we test it, they say it is not serious. But once the incision is given, they'll shout. So again, that is really very difficult uh, to assess whether uh, what level of uh, block has been achieved if they do not tell us properly. So that all yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that is where Dr. Bajwa says, you know, creating that kind of rapport with them to understanding with them right. is extremely important. You know, more often than not, uh, you know, this is something I, I've been uh, encountering nowadays in. In institutes of national importance, you have students coming from all over the world, all over the country, I would say, right? So you have a, a student who is coming from South India and is talking to a totally Punjabi female. There's a total disconnect on what they are understanding and perceiving to each other. So you know, it not only happens at peripheries, it also happens in institutes. <laughs> so you really need to fill that gap. That's very important. I believe you have or particular you. about giving the right dose, the right amount, and the right time. Right time. <laughs> Randa, madam, and Anju, madam, with your permission, can I invite Dr. Nares Palival, sir, for his expert opinion on the segmental spinal? You want to say something to the house? Yes, certainly. Yeah, yeah Dr. Nares, sir, please, sir, unmute yourself and please. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, there is misconception not about segmental spinals that it cannot be used for uh, caesarean sections. It can be very well used, especially in cases. Suppose if you, if you have put an epidural at L2, L3, L3, L4, and it has failed, and you want to give a spinal, giving spinal at L4, 5 will not achieve adequate levels. So what you can do is you can use the higher spaces and still use segmental spinal with two drug combinations. Like you can give 0.5 ml of the hyperbaric drug initially to cover the lumbosacral segments and 1 ml of the isobaric drugs that can cover your T4 levels. So segmental spinal can very well be used and I have been using this for all high-risk patients. Even isobaric drugs can cover your lumbosacral roots, but it takes some time. So it depends on whether you want to have an urgent action, you can use a two drug combination or you can use plain isobaric drugs, which have a very good hemodynamic stability, actually. 
we have now not practiced segmental spinal uh, during our practice so i don't know sir you are the next actually yeah, actually what happens in us it has not yet is, come in the guidelines no and parturients whatever you think is a l45 space is not always l45 you are inadvertently giving spinal at higher levels i mean 79% of the anesthesiologists in one study were found to give spinal at levels above l1 especially in obese and parturients so they are inadvertently using higher lumbar or thoracic spaces for giving spinal i mean though it is not in study but the, it is mentioned in the books it was confirmed with ultrasound guided uh, this thing that only 29% of the anesthetists were correctly identifying the required space for giving spinal especially in obese and parturients and also the level at which the cord terminates is variable it can be as high as t11 can be as low as l3 so dr paliwal i would like to um, comment here that um, segmental spinal have not yet come into the guidelines it's not in the guidelines so but uh, there are many reports our protocols no uh, we cannot base it on a national forum just on case reports because unless they come in for in protocols or guidelines we should not be using it for cesarean sections yet thank you sir uh, thank you madam uh, as you rightly said we still need some time to give our verdict about the segmental spinal in parturient spaces especially in this type of circumstances uh, can we move <coughs> on next question hello uh, to, yes sir uh, dr ravindra you, as you said that ketamine is totally controversial so next drug is dexmedomidine what is your experience about dexmedomidine in this type of circumstances sir can no, we use it yeah see whether you use ketamine or dexmedomidine or whichever see whether ketamine or dexmedomidine whether it can be used or not is not controversial whether you you secure the airway or not is what is controversial so if you are using whichever drug you use so i don't say that dexmed is contraindicated for cesarean section but you your aim should be no once the airway is secure then whichever technique whichever drug you use of course dexmed has is definitely not a total contraindication for cesarean section can i add something here you know you also yes, have sir. to fulfill the means what are you trying to aim at is a surgical anesthesia the amount of dexmedetomidine that you would need to create a surgical anesthesia at that point in time is something that we need, need to understand and the safety of two lives so i believe uh, as dr ravindra has very well pointed out airway securing the airway is of pertinent importance in these matter so if you are grading your uh, with ketamine with smaller doses say 0.5 mg uh, per kg you still need to be careful with your airways you have to have the expertise and the preparation behind you to secure the airway whenever the need arises thank you ma'am Uh, going back to the first case scenario, I am inviting Dr. Jaya. There is a question for you. Suppose I am not having a ICU in my setup, should I go for the cesarean or should I take this patient or not? I don't. We don't have the intensive care unit in our hospital, so how to proceed? This is a question in the chat box because this will help our private we practitioner can, also. We can do intensive care monitoring even in our wards. What we need is an and a cesarologist to monitor the patient so we have to monitor the vitals the coagulation profile the hemodynamic status that can be done in a ward if you don't have a icu set uh, icu setup no worries monitoring is done, is to be done by we we are going to monitor so we can monitor with whatever parameters and whatever facilities we have at our own setup Ma'am, actually, the problem is with the private practice. When you are in a private practice, you cannot stay there for a long time just monitoring one patient. What we can do here is, in peripheries, wherever the clinics, wherever the obstetric patients are being treated, you can have a tie-up with the centers where ICU care is there, so that you can timely shift the patient, as advised by Dr. Anju Madam, also taking care of all your parameters and the airways and everything, uh, because. 60% of the obstetric cases are done in the peripheral government or the private uh, hospitals 
you if you have a tie up with all the good centers where i should facilities are there i think uh, i don't think so because many times these patients uh, in a month you can get six or seven patient in a trot you cannot sit whole day for monitoring here you require help also you get tired also monitoring six to seven hours or maybe more than that sometimes so it's better to have a alliance or tie up in the peripheries with the uh, maybe a little smaller little larger towns or in the major centers where you can have tie up with the icus or high dependency units where you can shift the patient to monitor there a, a single person if you ask me monitoring in the peripheries about these cases is very difficult a herculean task you may not have a resources when, also when we are that, having a high risk patient then we can plan it uh, the conduction of uh, cesarean at a higher setup If accidentally a, yeah the patient goes bad then that that's true what you are saying we can shift the patient it's the anticipated and unanticipated high risk patients okay. many times the patient we may not anticipate sometimes these things who happen and even in the anticipation small, small risk can convert to higher risk now we seeing that this risk we can tide over with our skill and knowledge and our practices and then suddenly we are encountering with a you know catastrophic situations here the comes the real challenge here comes the real uh, skill uh, testing of the skill of the anesthesiologists who are working with the limited resources or uh, with a minimal manpower so i think these are a very challenging solution in mean, developing nations in the uh, western nations we don't have these type of scenarios but in our nation these scenarios are very common so i think uh, we require a good coordination between the peripheries and the centers or the good health centers so here the communication is very important as i think so discuss with the team the patient the relative that we are having this small setup it will be very difficult for us to handle these type of high challenges cases so we should not feel bad in referring the patient to the higher center sometimes it is safe for everyone this is my suggestion my assist to the house that's why this crisp theory is basically meant for these because we have to come to a solution to these type of problems Uh, we are actually here to help our all the practitioners academicians and the students many controversies will be emanating from our discussions but the real solution lies the see our uh, sunanda madam is there she is epitome of obstetric and anesthesiology in our country and dr anju madam is also there these type of things uh, coming to the fore they are really going to be helping our practicing anesthesiologists the academicians everywhere so i think uh, our purpose is getting fulfilled dr sharath so nicely you are coordinating and moderating so keep on going and it's i nice if people are getting to know about the thing everybody has their own point in, in fact I, i feel that this webinar is really interesting because at the end of two hours or more than that 245 members have still logged in so that shows that uh, everybody is interested in listening to the interactive discussion and uh, uh, pulls from our chairperson madam going by the theme and agenda of a crisp series uh, jaya madam we know theoretically we should not rely upon a single platelet uh, count it should always be the trend that we should uh, seek for but when a patient comes for emergency section this is the question from the chat box and with a single platelet count what do we do suppose if the count is 70000 can we still go ahead with spinal yeah, yeah we count? can go 70000 is the borderline limit at which uh, spinal can be given Uh, for phase final either manisha ma'am or ravindra sir can answer is there any role for ultrasonography is the question in the chat box so, certainly oh. ultrasound helps in in uh, in the spine the spinal anatomy especially in obese parturients otherwise you know usually we are all very proficient in spinals as you will know you know none of us do um, ultrasound for to give us spinal anesthesia which is very true but in a difficult spine in such situations probably ultrasound helps but the problem is if you are using your ultrasound probe for the first time in a difficult spine you will never be able to identify any structures so the best thing is try and practice your ultrasound in normal individuals and then probably in, it will come uh, you know handy in difficult spines yes so, that is that is what i wanted to tell you that it's not very easy giving under uh, usg guided spinal because you need a lot of practice 
and uh, in emergency situations uh, it really becomes very hodgepodge and the thing that you have been doing in so many years the uh, palpation of the back and the uh, pro spine prominences that uh, that really is uh, more helpful uh, only if you are conversant with a usg guided spinal and then yeah yeah, true but uh, for that usually what we try to do is do it beforehand and uh, mark the space uh, so when when we have a lot of time we day, do it in the morning the patient is taken later on or do it a day before so that is how is the situation right now but i don't know if people who are very proficient doing it they can do it thank you dr jay dr jay one more question for you yeah uh, uh, Dr. Jyoti is asking, in eclemptic patients with deranged LFT and RFT and patient, patient is on magnesium sulfate, what is the choice of neuromuscular agents, whether it's atracurium or other, and what should be the dose? The dose has to be reduced uh, looking at the clinical response because uh, peripheral nerve stimulator better said than uh, we have it. We are not even having at uh, many medical colleges also, leave alone in the periphery. So clinically, we have to give small doses because then magnesium prolongs the action of these uh, neuromuscular blocking agents. So we should... Uh, two, third, two, third, two third dose. And we should Why also monitor the level of the magnesium also? If it is available, it, it should be monitored. There's no... Clinically problem. also, we can monitor the... Um, Signs of toxicity, the urine output, yes. the patellar reflex. Patellar reflex, state. exactly. Yeah. But why is she resorting to general anesthesia? Is there a particular reason for it? Deranged renal function and gen, uh, hepatic functions? LFTs, I believe. Yeah. Yes, madam. So why should uh, general anesthesia be given? She can easily go in for a regional yes, anesthesia. Uh, Sharad, I think we have covered almost all the questions and uh, if we continue, we can continue endlessly. Uh, I agree with you. So, I think yeah. it's time to uh, just wind up. Uh, can you just go ahead with the vote of thanks, please? So, thank you very much. I, for this, uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone and I am inviting our secretary, honorary secretary, sorry, uh, treasurer, Dr. Manoj, for the vote of thanks. Dr. Manoj. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarath Boss. Uh, I am thankful to ISA Nestal for giving me opportunity for the vote of thanks. I am very thankful to the our visionary ISA National President, Dr. M. B. Bhimeshwar Sir, for his blessing, guidance, and support for clinical research, reasoning, and pro problem solving session that is crisp on obstructive anesthesia. My sincere gratitude to ISA National Vice President. Dr. Mahesh Kumar Sinha, sir, and uh, IC National President-elect Dr. J.B. Divatya, sir, for their continuous encouragement and the blessing. I am very thankful to our IC National Dynamic Honorary Secretary, Dr. Sukhvinder J. Singh Vajwa, for his hard work and working day-night for the uh, upliftment of our IC society. My sincere thanks to IC National Academic Chairman, Dr. Venkat Giri KM, sir, for his guidance and support. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Naveen Malhotra, sir, past secretary of ISA National, and for his commitment and hard work for the society. Thank you so much, Naveen Malhotra, sir, and uh, past treasurer, Dr. Bhendra Sarma, sir, for his support and help. My sincere gratitude to the, all the governing council, uh, especially Dr. Manisha Katikar, Madam, Sunil Sethi, Sir, Rajiv Gupta, oh, who are present here in the meeting uh, for their support and guidance. I'm very thankful to today's Chris webinar chairpersons, Dr. Sunanda Gupta, Ma'am, and Dr. Anju Gerewal, Madam, for their excellent academic input us, which was very beneficial for all of us. My sincere thanks to Dr. G.L. Ravinder, sir, Dr. Manisha Sembhankar, madam, 
डॉक्टर जया लालवानी मैडम फॉर देयर एक्सलेंट प्रेजेंटेशन व्हिच वाज वेरी बेनिफिशियल फॉर ऑल द एनेस्थेसियोलॉजिस्ट स्पेशली प्राइवेट प्रैक्टिशनर फॉर डे टू डे प्रैक्टिस आई एम वेरी थैंकफुल टू द प्रोग्राम हेड ऑफ दिस क्रिस वेबिनार डॉक्टर चिंताला किशन सर एंड डॉक्टर मनीषा मैडम हेड्स ऑफ टू डॉक्टर मनीषा काटिकर मैडम फॉर हिज Uh, her continuous uh, hard work for this webinar my sincere thanks to academic coordinator dr sarath kumar sir and dr punam godki madam for their excellent coordinating the program very nicely thank you dr sarath kumar boss and dr punam godki madam my thanks to all the office bearer of the state and city branch of isa all the past president of ic national all the city state uh, member all the delegates and all the post uh, post graduate student of ic thank you so much long live ic over to dr sarab thank you dr manoj and for the, uh, thank you for your nice comments about our cme and it was really hard work of each and every one especially the speakers they have really worked hard and i also want to thank the chair persons and my co moderator dr punam and a special thanks to the isa national body dr bajwa and president sir dr navin sir is also there dr venkat giri and everyone it is really hard work we all give our best we tried our level best to give uh let's hope the people have enjoyed the comments box is full of good things but we want some criticism also what we can add that we can do better in the better next time if i have some if you want to add something that you should have done this added this that is also always accepted so please give suggestion also how to improve because the way the life is all about moving forward with new things so i request all the participants if we have find any deficiency please address it's not about goody goody things we want to learn from our mistakes so please come forward if you have any things to add suggestion either go to dr bajwa or any one of us so next time we will try to improve thank you very much and over to dr bajwa thank you dr sharad at least the it was already there was critical things also being discussed in the session i don't think so anything was left we can't criticize which is not there everything i think all the good points were discussed and the cons and pros were equally discussed equal opportunity was given to almost everyone in a very short span of time and uh, definitely these type of interactive session they are required as i told in the beginning that it's very difficult for everyone to attend the conferences and the cmes go there and having their knowledge getting the pearls of wisdom for these type of things now these type of interactive sessions here everybody comes out with honestly with their experiences then i think backing up all the critical and clinical problems with the scientific evidence it's a way to go forward the practitioners i don't think so uh, every practitioner gets good time to study and good time to get refresh about is all the academic knowledge but these type of interactive session where we have the you know the all our uh, academic experts there they can guide they can guide they can uh, you know guidelines are always not read properly they are not always followed properly but these type of interactive session in the long run will definitely give a clue a way or you know i can make a you know something inroads into the daily practice of anesthesia this is a beginning this is a beginning i can see that today the discussion was so healthy so critical definitely the loops of weaknesses are always there but those can be covered in the coming days but the starting is itself is a you know a stepping stone to better our anesthesia practices what the mix of academic experts the practitioners and there are uh, you know definitely going to be a difference of opinion among the experts based on the guidelines based on the subjective experiences based upon the practice of anesthesia for so many years but ultimately we have to come to a certain conclusion that what is safe for anesthesia and what is safe for anesthesiologist that is the way to go forward in this type of interactive session and i i would like to have some comments from the our aven and faculty who so wants they can give uh, 5 to 10 minutes for the comments so that's very important because the first session we require comment they can raise hand or they can unmute themselves to give comments for this session 
criticism also if it is there everything yeah, everything try to improve try to improve open, next time open yeah. session everybody can can come come with their comments and suggestions what uh, i would like to say is that um, a take home message for everyone who is there on the session that each and every institute should have their own protocols and it should be based on the resources that is available to them the local context and stick to those protocols so that anyone else you are on leave someone else is there he knows exactly what to do in that situation so that is what we are lacking in our institutes a small district hospital stand alone nursing homes that we do not have our own protocols don't follow the general uh, rcoa pro protocols or the soap guidelines but at least form your own protocols so that you are not left in the lurch when you face such a uh, catastrophe in your institute and if i can add to what ma'am said is then revisit them whenever there is a keep auditing them keep revisiting them and whenever there is indeed a event or a need uh, to you know go back to them or there is some new evidence generated you need to revisit them according to your settings that's extremely important and keep everybody on the same page so also along with that having you know uh, if we can add perhaps uh, in your subsequent crisp uh, sessions sessions on teamwork sessions on communication are something that especially in periphery and that is where we, perhaps we need to look at thank you so much it has been an excellent session to all of you thank you so much anju madam we will definitely in fact we would in uh, we would request all the faculties as well as all the audience to suggest more and more topic for is at risk sessions so that we can include them in all our future series dr manisha may i come in sir please oh, yeah. see um, uh, warm regards to all and it is always a, always a pleasure to listen to dr chananda ma'am and all the speakers panelists they were all fabulous my my input would be that yes we all are institutes but the vision behind this program which dr bajra and dr munish has shared along with dr manisha katakar is to strengthen the periphery to strengthen the periphery and i would just with this fast track spinal anesthesia or rapid sequence spinal anesthesia i must confess throughout their life our private practitioners have been giving rapid sequence spinal anesthesia nobody has well please don't take it otherwise nobody has scrub they always wear gloves make the patient sitting no local needle in csf out drug in patient supine <laughs> but once it was published in bga it becomes standard of care so so i request the private practitioners please don't think what you are doing is wrong when we were young consultants this is not obstetric and anesthesia but pcnl we were used to be doing it in ga and there was a big debate ga versus regional anesthesia for pcnl surgery but gradually over the period of the time majority of us in the institutes are also started doing it under in the institute so my request to private practitioner is please utilize this forum which has been provided by isa and learn from the experience and wisdom of stalwarts but you are no less stalwarts in your own field because you are working alone so please share your experiences interact with the eminent faculty so that we can come to some consensus building and we can learn from each other thank you very much i think anybody wants and uh, this give to give the suggestion on this forum so that we can wind up after that anyone hello sir so actually the, today's uh, you know topic selection was excellent in the sense you know day to day the, the problems that everybody faces every day such problems should be given in this crisp session so i think there are you need to take the common things most common things and then discuss here more than the you know things which can be done only in institutes periphery should be given importance in this session where 
you're doing a, a hernia raffi and a, a spinal cesarean section and a spinal small things small small things and the controversies in that should be discussed thank you so much it was a wonderful session hello i want to say something can you give a chance to me Yes, Hello. sir. Dr. Chintala, you are the program head. Why not? Yes, yes. Sir. Yeah, that's right. Dr. Ravindra. Sir. Dr. Ravindra. Yes, sir. So, uh, how many cases you have given continuous spinal? Uh, two cases, sir. Only so, when there was ac accidental dural puncture, I threaded yeah. the catheter and then used yeah. it as um, continuous spinal. Otherwise, I have not I did used it. Continuous spinal at all. For elective okay. cases, I have given any time? No, sir. I have still not done. Sir, I would started. like to add, I would like to add with permission. Please, please go ahead. Yes. Not for cesarean, but uh, I've been using continuous spinal for high risk cases with low EF. We give very small uh, hyperbaric VP vacane and mm. for hernia and some these cases. Mm. What is the first dose and what is the next dose? Hello. How much ML well, you have one, given in the first? One ML, one ML. One it's ML, which percentage? 0.5 percent hyperbaric upivacaine. And then next to top up dose? Next, most mostly the surgeons they complete it. Means no, uh, no, no. In an hour. First, yeah. First you have given one ML. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, what is the time first given to uh, next to top up dose? How much time it will take? About an hour. About an hour. Then uh, if about we get, yeah, hour. one hour, yeah. So did hour. you expect uh, one CC of Bupivik uh, and it comes uh, one hour? Hello. So this is what I, I have think. been, uh, this is what is my experience and subsequent doses I have given 0.5, okay, okay, okay. 0.5 ml. Uh, can I add something uh, about continuous spinal? Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, Continuous spinal is actually a very good technique, especially in obese parturients. It can be also used for uh, labor analgesia whenever you get an accidental dural puncture or in special cases like previous spine surgery or uh, when there is uh, difficult spines. In those cases, the epidural cannot, uh, I mean, unpredictable. In those cases, you can use this continuous spinal anesthesia and there is a wide range of drugs especially the isobaric, hypobaric, and hyperbaric, which can be used. There is also availability of, uh, I mean, uh, fine catheters intralong from Pajung, which we are using for continuous segmental spinal anesthesia also at thoracic levels. But uh, whenever there is accidental dural puncture, you can use your epidural catheters. Sir, what volume you are giving then? Just 0.5 to 1 ml of increments. Just keep in... Uh, Mind that the dead space of the epidural catheter which is around 1 ml. You have to keep in mind. Either you have to flush with normal saline or you have to take the drug into account when you push an X2. We but are using mostly isobaric drugs. Dr. Naresh, but in this obstetric anesthesiology, I think uh, rather than getting adventurous in doing such but things. Not adventurous. It is recommended technique. Sure, no, it's not see, recommended. There are a lot, even no, inhalers. It is in our country. Uh, high risk uh, cardiac listen, cases, they are mentioned. Rest, in our country, where the tradition of, you know, the bearing down mother or the entire family is behind the parturients. And yes, here, the anesthesiologist, not anesthesiologist is doing something and something comes out. The life of the anesthesiologist becomes a hell because even the surgeon or the gynecologist will you, not be helping the anesthesiologist. You go through Millers and even in other... We are not talking about a developing a developed nation. We are talking about a developing uh, even country. It is given in books. It is a recommended technique for high-risk cardiac cases and yeah. all. Hey, but we are talking yeah. here about the... About I, mean, sir. I have a strong objection about the adventurous thing. Anyway, it's sir, Naresh, sir, we can have this discussion in one of the Chris series, Continuous Spiral. We will definitely discuss yeah, I have my presentation and I am presenting this since so long about uh, continuous segmental and continuous spinal anesthesia. Yeah. We will definitely discuss this in one of the Chris series. No, no it's not adventurous. I, I mean, get Dr. Baliwal that uh, continuous spinal is a recommended technique. The only issue is wherever you practice, not Dr. Paliwal, he practices in a high-end institute. I would say the district hospitals and all, if you have adequate... Yes, you need to have some... I mean, you can maintain. 
only then go in for your continuous now what we do is we tie down the catheter when there is no expert uh, post operative observation care is there so that it should not be misused we label it strictly and we keep the okay. catheter in for 24 hours to avoid pdph these yeah. are the recommendations you use for this okay and each top up should be given by the anesthesiologist yes anesthesiologist only yeah. if you are not giving the top up i just tie down the dr. catheter dr parival sir it not be used dr parival sir yes you are talking about continuous spinal anesthesia for cesarean section it can be used for uh, when uh, if we, you are doing it for labor yes. analgesia and if the patient wants uh, uh, patient goes in for cesarean you can use the same catheter for uh, lscs also for high risk cases like especially the aortic severe aortic stenosis and severe this it is recommended even in millers also i mean so, agree sir sir please sir the bottom line is that suppose somebody is getting in a periphery and getting an as done forget about uh, suppose it is a civil hospital or is a single person he is doing under epidural and gets a no no no, no, no sir, sir, sir if if it is a high risk patient as in a freelance private practitioners won't it be better to have it in a duct to get it done in a center where all facilities are available? Yes, yes, it should be referred. One, one, mean, one I mean, sir. Secondly, secondly, majority of the cesarean sections are done under spinal anesthesia. Okay. So once needle is there, where comes the? Well, I'm just thinking. Suppose I'm I'm an institute, but suppose I'm in a freelance practice. Where does continuous spinal anesthesia fits for a cesarean section for a cesarean delivery? If you are. Your... If it you are is, doing it under, uh, uh, I mean, epidural, and there is accidental dural puncture, you can very well convert sir, it to a continuous spinal anesthesia. It was not labor analgesia, sir. So suppose patient has come for a surgery. No, even for a surgical anesthesia, we have done gastrectomies, and even I have recently uh, done a 28 kg female uh, for in sir, continuous segment of spine. Sir, we appreciate everything. Just, just understand the mindset of a private practitioner. Forget I'm in shoot and you are doing uh, continuous panel, uh, segmental panel. What I'm trying to say is a freelance private practitioner who is listening to this talk, he will think, yes, sir, I have to spinal lagana ya epidural needle hi kahan se aagi chizir infection ke liye. No, no. You are not getting my point. He is not getting my point. Either it should be a planned technique or it can be converted when there is accidental dural puncture. So it should not be done in a freelance where there is no, I mean, uh, yeah. Yes, that's, 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 that's the okay, point yes. I already mentioned. Right. Unless right. you are confident that's in That's the entire life. crux of this crisp series. We are basically targeting the practitioners in the peripheries here. So what is the most safest technique for them? The consensus is going to be built upon that. So at yes. least to help our practitioners who are not able to attend our conferences, CMEs regularly, the entire objective of the crisp series is to take these practices to their door. So that is the take home message for every practitioners to be safe for themselves, for the patient, for our humanity also. That is the basic thing. And we know there are many techniques which we can uh, doing in our institutions, but in the peripheries, though people are alone, they won't have minimal resources, manpower is not there, skilled manpower is not there. And when the complications come, they have to look at themselves only. So I think Amen. our guest has done a wonderful job today and really, Thankful for all our uh, yes, actually, and, even uh, if the anesthesia is not given. And then all our eminent faculties, then the speakers, and everybody contributing to this. I think the time is quite high now. Because there yeah. will be many questions left unanswered, as Dr. Manisha Kartikar Madam said rightly, that we can cover in the next section. I think it's a time to say goodbye to everyone so that you can go and have your dinner and get to the family also. Otherwise, half of the our family members they will be after us that we are sitting all, all the day on the you know the webinars and everything so thank you so much dr bajwa just, yeah. a, just a little mention i would like to thank i would like to thank dr shweta mogal because i there was no mobile number available on her article but i could contact her on her email and she responded immediately and she joined today's webinar thank you dr shweta for your great it's input. my pleasure ma'am thank you i'll send her mobile number to you now She's she sent me she sent me now <laughs> Okay. Sir, just to add a very laudable initiative, 
uh, and especially so for your uh, for the practitioners who need it very badly and you very rightly said that we miss what we wanted to hear when we uh, go to the conferences we run from one hall to the other and miss in the process so uh, a very very good initiative and i really feel privileged to be a part of uh, this very crisp program on day one of it thank you so much manisha ma'am one point Yes. Uh, our parent bodies, ISA, all other sisterly bodies. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, and, and she has been the president of ISA Nagpur. I, I have uh, I missed that slide in the process. The first Do slide was ISA, the comment? second was AOA. Do I have time for a quick comment? AOA is a part of ISA Bajpa. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. That's what I've said, na. Anyway, <laughs> just on the correction of that, like, uh, Doctor Shiv Shankar want to say something. Doctor Shiv Shankar, please unmute yourself. I have, sir. Yeah, yeah, please, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, it was a very interesting uh, debate. And uh, like uh, you said, uh, running out of time, and I don't want to take too much time. And I have uh, worked for almost uh, three decades in the UK and in Austria and Vienna. Having uh, after, I've studied Miller, all the three volumes myself, multiple times. All I want to say is the uh, any technique is as good as what the anesthetist is confident in. Like the saying says, why you're in Rome, be a Roman. And in my experience in India, 95% of the operating theaters or hospitals do not even have an induction room or an anesthetic room or a dedicated, uh, what we call is an ODA or anesthetic technician. So with these circumstances, I think a straightforward, quick single shot spinal or a continuous epidural if needed, would be the safest uh, technique for majority of the people, except for people like uh, you know some of the faculties whose names are not coming up in the Zoom, I have got ex extensive experience and you know working in Ames or Chandigarh or Apollo, Indra Prast or whatever great institutions like that. But 95% of the population in India and the hospitals, I think, are very basic. Uh, so. Thank you very much for my, uh, giving me the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, so may I take, may I talk, Dr. Bajwa, Dr. sir? Dr. 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 Will cut yeah. sir. Please, please. Yes. please sir. Uh, thank you for giving me opportunity. I've been practicing anesthesia in peripheral nursing homes since 1979. And my right. first anesthesia I gave as an intern in 1975 for a rupture uterus when the patient was in a shock. And the gynecologist told me to give, he was giving local infiltration and he requested me to, he ordered me to give injection pethidine as an analgesic. And he did a caesarean section under local, that was 75. In 79, I started practicing. I used to practice run from Bivandi, Wada, and sometimes I used to carry blood also with me. Rather, the obstetrician would invite to a district places to when there were patients undergoing caesarean section. Now, coming to peripheral nursing homes, the most tricky combination is a junior anesthetist and senior obstetrician, particularly in the midnight, when the resources are limited. As somebody widely exactly mentioned, the assistant anesthetist is the perfect assistant to obstetrician. Half the time he will tell, adjust the light, do this. In fact, lots of times anesthetists have to resuscitate the neonates. So the situation. Thank you very much, and congratulations for doing such an excellent. Uh, uh, CME and uh, right now I'm joining from USA. Right now yes, it's sir. early morning. Yeah, uh, since quarter to six, I'm here. I enjoy being here. Thank you. And then particularly uh, this nursing of anesthesia practice and obstetrician is a very tricky situation because you are also there is a lack of blood bank. The biggest thing is the hemorrhage. There is anticipated unanticipated hemorrhage. Then the anesthesiologist, obstetrician, whole team comes in trouble. Thank you very much for giving me opportunity and congratulations to all. Thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, I think the single shot spinal is the commonest thing which is practicing by the practice by obstetric anesthetists most of the time. Thank you, Kadkade sir, for joining. Thanks, thanks. thanks, sir, thanks. It's our, it was our privilege that you joined from US in the morning, early morning. <laughs> yeah. Early. Yeah. But at the crisp has uh, such yeah. some good heights. That's a great achievement, and we are really feeling uh, proud of it rather. Intercontinental. So, yeah, intercontinental. And uh, to everyone, you can always circulate that this our webinar will be available on YouTube, on ISA NHQ and YouTube. So recording can be seen there. 
and it is definitely going to be seen by many many people uh, uh, right now uh, shall we say goodbye and good night to each and everyone yes thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good, night. Thank you. good night good night good night to all of you thank you thanks thank you thanks, thanks 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 long live isa long live isa thank you